Hi, so um, I'm now doing question 22 from section two of prep test 84. This one is a parallel reasoning question type. So uh, the question stem, stem asks, which one of the following arguments is most similar in its reasoning to the argument above? Um, so this one um, is uh, just, it doesn't say flawed or questionable reasoning or flawed argument or anything like that. So um, this one is just a structure question. I say just a structure question, but um, basically it's, we're not matching the flaw, we're matching, we're matching the reasoning or the reasoning structure. Um, and uh, so here we want to figure out uh, what the premises are, what the conclusion is, how they connect, right? Um, so what the method of reasoning is, um, and then try to find similar um, conclusion type, premise type. The order of them is not important, um, but um, we want them to be a, a similar type. We want to look for language that indicates um, quantity, level of certainty, um, uh, language that maybe indicates, um, are we making a prediction or are we making a prescription, which would be um, saying what should happen or what's ideal or what's desirable um, or like the, the best thing to do. Um, is there a language of comparison? So um, those kinds of things are important to look out for. Um, and the specific language isn't relevant, right? So we're looking for logically equivalent language, um, synonymous language, not uh, specific word matches. Okay. Um, all right. So um, let's get into it. Um, the stimulus. The writers of the television show Ambitions could make their characters more realistic than they currently are. Um, so that's interesting as well. It, a lot of this has to do with like the modification of a verb tense, right? So here could make their characters more realistic than they currently are, right? So that there's possibility there, right? Rather than um, probability or um, a uh, prescription of some kind, right? Um, so um, not that they should make them more realistic, not that they will make them more realistic, um, not that they're probably will, you know, anything like that, but that they could um, make them more realistic than they currently are. Um, and more also would be um, kind of an important word. So if you are able to identify um, like the adverbs and um, the modifying verbs like in a, a verb tense, right? So uh, that um, tends to be, I think, most relevant like that. Those are, I think, are probably the most relevant words um, if you're looking for, you know, types, types of words in a sentence. Um, so, yeah, um, could make their characters more realistic than they currently are. Currently would also be an important word, another adverb. Um, but, okay, so contrast, they know their viewership would shrink if they did. All right, so that word if is key, right? That conditional indicator word, right? Those guys are always important. So let's write out what that relationship is. So I need to get my um, annotation tool thing. <laughs> All right. So um, go with something a little darker, a little more beautiful. Okay. And I need to get that out of the way before I do. All right. So if they made them more realistic, then viewership would shrink. Um, so if viewership doesn't shrink, so either stays the same or goes up, then they didn't make them more realistic than they currently are. All right, uh, the writers will choose to maximize their audience. Okay, so they're going to 
um, maximize. Um, so that's, you know, not shrinking, right? So maximize, therefore not shrink, um, therefore they're, um, the writers are not going to make the characters more realistic. Yeah, so they won't be develop, developed in a more realistic manner. So that makes sense, right? Um, and so what we see here is conditional reasoning and we see reasoning by contrapositive. So what they're doing um, is they're saying that uh, the necessary condition doesn't hold, right? They're, they're um, not going after the necessary condition. So they're not going to um, trigger that with the sufficient condition. So they're not gonna do the thing that they know would trigger the thing that they're trying to avoid, right? They're trying to go in the opposite direction. They're trying to maximize. Um, so essentially here we have reasoning by um, contrapositive. So here it's the final thing is therefore not more realistic. Okay, and so the reasoning here is reasoning by contrapositive. And so we're looking for that. We're looking for um, the premise to set up a conditional relationship. Um, so that's one of the premises has to set up the conditional relationship. And the second premise has to say that we can negate the requirement, right? Or negate the necessary condition. Therefore, conclusion, we have the negation of the sufficient condition. Okay. Um, so what's most similar? So A, if a company's failure is due to a broader economic collapse, then it is not fair to blame the company's executives for the failure. All right. So um, if it is fair to blame the company, we should be looking at what the contrapositive of that would be, right? Um, but here, um, the second premise is that there was a broader economic collapse when this company went bankrupt. Um, so the fact that those things happened at the same point in time, the correlation of those two events wouldn't actually prove causation, which is what is necessary for the sufficient condition to be met, right? The failure has to be due to a broader economic collapse. So, I mean, this is actually a faulty argument. So I can eliminate it based on that alone. And that would be a good enough reason to eliminate this one. Um, so it's not similar in its reasoning because A has faulty reasoning because it relies on the assumption that correlation equals causation. So that's you know one of the issues. But also, um, even if we went with that assumption that in this case, the correlation does mean that there's causation, um, the, we would still run into a problem in that it doesn't have the same structure because it's not reasoning by contrapositive. It's actually um, just saying that the presence of the sufficient condition leads us to know that the necessary condition is also true. Um, rather than saying that the absence of the necessary condition tells us that there's an absence of the sufficient condition. Um, so uh, yeah, so a couple reasons actually to eliminate A. B, if the failure is due to broader economic collapse, it's not fair. So starting us off with the same one, um, but there's no broader economic collapse. They're negating the sufficient condition. Um, so when you negate the sufficient condition, you can't come to any conclusion. That, um, and so that's a mistake where you're treating a sufficient condition as if it's necessary, right? Treating um, the sufficient condition as if the absence of it can lead you to a deduction, um, but the absence of a sufficient condition doesn't uh, doesn't allow us to come to a conclusion. Um, so that's what we would also refer to as a mistake in negation, um, and uh, that's yeah, that's a problem. Um, that's um, a mistake, right? That's why it's called a mistake in negation. Um, so, I mean, I can give like a really quick example. Um, of that with like a, a fairly simple conditional statement. So um, all Labrador retrievers are dogs. Um, that means that if um, I know that my friend has a Labrador retriever, I know my friend has a dog, right? Um, now, I would also know that if my friend doesn't have a dog, that they 
don't have a Labrador retriever. That's the contrapositive. So that's a logical deduction that I've made from the statement that all Labrador retrievers are dogs and the information that my friend doesn't have a dog. Um, then I can come to the conclusion that they do not have a Labrador retriever. So that's the type of reasoning that we're seeing in this argument here. Um, but what B is suggesting is that we would be able to say that um, if I know my friend doesn't have a lab, they don't have a Labrador retriever, I can conclude that they don't have a dog. And we know that's not true, right? We know that it's possible that my friend just has a different breed of dog. Um, and so that's mistakenly saying that just because they don't have um, a lab, which we know just falls under the umbrella category of dogs, um, that therefore they don't have a dog. We, and we know that that's not um, true in, well, not even intuitively, but just because of our, you know, basic understanding things we already believe um, are true about uh, the world. But the sentence structure there is exactly the same as what, what B is doing, um, where we have, you know, because the failure isn't due to broad economic collapse, therefore it is fair to blame the company's executives. Um, I, you know, the company's executives deserve the blame. Um, but that's not necessarily true, right? There are, you know, potentially other um, people, other entities, other groups that could be to blame. Um, just because it's not broad economic collapse doesn't mean that we can blame the company's executives. Just like, just because my friend doesn't have a Labrador retriever doesn't mean that they don't have a dog, that there's, there are other types of dogs. Um, so even though we might not um, like automatically be like, well, there are other entities that could be blamed because we don't know, you know, the circumstances necessarily, or maybe in the moment we can't think of other things that could be blamed um, the same way that in the moment with the dogs, like um, we think of, oh, well, there are other breeds of dogs. Like maybe you think you start listing other breeds of dog in your head because you're aware that there are other ones. Um, so yeah, it's a little, um, a little harder, obviously, with uh, the examples in the LSAT than the you know dog and lab example. But the sentence structure is still the same, right? The relationship between the ideas is established by that sentence structure, and so it becomes a bit of a formula. And so eventually, you should be able to spot when they're making that mistake in these examples and in this subject matter just as easily as you spot that mistake in the dog and Labrador retriever example. So um, that's, yeah, again, rabbit trail, <laughs> um, but, uh, um, but that's how we eliminate B. All right, next one. Um, if the executives are responsible, then it must be possible to say that they should say what they should have done differently. So if it's not possible to say what they should have done differently, then they weren't responsible. Okay. Now what's that? That's my contrapositive, right? So I did the contrapositive in my head of we're going to negate the necessary condition, right? So rather than it must be possible, it's okay, well, it's impossible. So if it's impossible, then they must not be responsible uh, for the company's failure. But then when we get to our conclusion, I'm like, mm, okay, therefore, if you cannot say what they should have done differently, then you should not blame them for the failure. Um, the fact that an individual can't say um, what the executive should have done differently. Um, that's a different thing than it's impossible. Like saying that it's impossible is a higher bar than just like, oh, you, since you as an individual can't say um, what they should have done differently. Um, so yeah, this one, I mean, it's the closest we've seen so far in terms of reasoning by contrapositive, but 
I don't like that match of just because one person can't say what they should have done differently, that meets the bar of negating the necessary condition and saying that it's not possible to say. So, um, I mean, like I said, best out of the ones we've seen so far. So I'll keep it until we find a better one. Um, but I don't love those things being equated. Um, D, if the company's executives were responsible, then the losses would have been greater than those of its competitors, um, but their losses were less than their competitors, so therefore they're not responsible. Okay, so C is out, D is better. All right, and um, there is another reason why D is better. So not only um, is it definitely true that the necessary condition here is properly negated and we're not making like a false equivalence, right, um, between oh, you can't say it, therefore it's impossible to say it. Um, but here we have the same sort of um, idea where we have shrinking versus maximizing because not shrinking could just be staying the same, right? Um, just like that they would have been greater where, 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 I mean, that could have been, oh, they're just on par, right? They're just equal. But here it says less. So we have greater and less and shrink and maximize. So that thing of, you know, the increase versus the decrease and um, that the negation, it's, you know, not only the negation in that, you know, it's not greater, but it's less. It's not only the negation in that it didn't shrink, but it actually, they want to maximize it. So, um, so D really matches that language well. So um, it's, um, like a better fit even than just reasoning by contrapositive. It like adds that um, extra element that makes it super similar to the original. So I love D. Um, I would pick D. Let's see what's going on with E. So since the failure was due to a broader economic collapse, it's not fair to blame the company's executives for the failure, but that means that when it was succeeding, because of the, broad, the broader economy growing, the executives did not deserve the credit. Okay, so this one actually never establishes a conditional relationship between um, these ideas, right? So it never establishes that if such and such, then such and such. It just says because a therefore B rather than if A then B, okay? So um, yeah, we don't have conditional, we don't have a conditional relationship established between um, broader economic collapse and it not being fair to blame the company's executives. Um, and then we have this like extra piece that's um, that goes beyond and kind of, um, the flip side of it, you know, what's the flip side. So uh, this, we don't have reasoning by contrapositive here. Um, so E is out. We don't have like a negation of a necessary condition because we don't have the establishment of a necessary condition. It's just a completely different um, type of argument. Um, yeah, so D should be the correct answer on this one. And I'm just gonna go ahead and Double check that with the show answer button. D is the correct answer. Um, so yeah, that's it for this demonstration. Um, as always, if you have follow-up questions, please let me know. Um, and uh, yeah, same goes for other sections as well. I don't, I haven't, I don't know if I've done any reading comprehension on here. Um, but I mean that takes longer, of course, um, to review reading comp, um, but I'm up for it. I'm going through a passage and um, just demonstrating like how I would approach it. Um, reading comprehension, uh, you know, fair warning, reading comprehension is my least favorite section. And um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's also, I guess my, my worst section, but I still, um, do 
perform well on it. I've learned to perform well on it. I have a lot of experience with it. Um, and uh, yeah, even though, though it is my least favorite section, um, it's, yeah, it's like obviously still really important. It's even more important now with the LSAT Flex because reading comprehension has more questions than any other section. So it's actually the most heavily weighted um, compared to the other sections in terms of like its impact on your overall score. Um, so yeah, um, I think something that um, I've learned through writing the LSAT myself and um, law school <laughs> and um, and then tutoring uh, the LSAT um, is just, you know, just because something's not your favorite um, doesn't mean that you can't find some joy in like excelling at it, I suppose, um, and learning to excel at it and like the process of improving at something. Um, so I think that on its own can uh, provide some enjoyment, especially if you're like a little bit competitive with yourself, um, even when, you know, you wouldn't be doing it like for fun or leisure or whatever, right? Um, so yeah, the, the challenge of it and uh, taking on the challenge can be really rewarding, um, even if it's not like fun. Um, so logic games for me are fun. <laughs> like I get excited for the new ones to come out. Um, I don't get excited to read the, <laughs> the reading comprehension sections when they come out. Um, but I do because I like to test myself and, um, I enjoy the challenge and I like getting better at it. And, um, so anyways, that's, um, that's, uh, where I'm at with reading comp. Okay. I'll end this now, and um, I think maybe there's some logic game uh, questions that I can do next. Um, so yeah, have a good one, and let me know if you have any more questions. I really should like cue up the stop recording button.